The man who helped Las Vegas develop into the number one tourist destination in the world wasn't a casino owner, a performer, a dealer, or an architect. He didn't create the neon signs, develop any casino standard practices, or build any of its properties. However, without E. Perry Thomas, virtually none of the aforementioned would exist. An argument can be made that no single individual has done more to direct the growth and development of Las Vegas in the last half century than E. Perry Thomas. As a side note, the dates included in this episode are best estimates determined by researching the stories with the property's history as Perry intentionally didn't like to disclose specifics when talking about history. Edward Perry Thomas was born in Ogden, Utah on June 29th of 1921. His name is comprised of the middle names of his parents, his father's Edward and his mother's Perry. He grew up a Mormon, although stopped attending the church at age 14. However, his wife and children would still actively participate in the church. Perry's father was a plumbing contractor. He was so successful that he was able to purchase the bank he did business with when it failed during the Great Depression. Perry's first job was working for his father at the bank, collecting loan payments. While in college, World War II broke out. Yeah, Perry had been part of the ROTC program since junior high. ROTC is the Reserve Officers Training Corps, and in December of 1941, they were all called to Army basic training. Perry wanted to join the Air Corps, but had problems with his eardrums bursting every time he flew above five or 6,000 feet. As a result, Perry was hard of hearing for the rest of his life. So they washed him out of the program, and he returned to the Army, where he eventually rose to the rank of sergeant. During the war, he was assigned to intelligence work while in France. However, Perry will be the first one to clarify that it sounds more important than it was. He did little more than bookkeep and various other clerical duties. While in the army, in his spare time, Perry would engage in what would be the extent of his gambling experience, playing bridge for 25 to 50 cents a game. But by far, Perry will be the first to tell you the most valuable experience the army taught him was how to relate with all different kinds of people something he considers some of the most important education of his life. Late in the war, Perry's outfit was scheduled to relocate to Japan. The night before they were scheduled to be shipped out, they were informed that the atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima and their orders were canceled. When he returned from the war, he still had two and a half years left of college to complete. He asked his fraternity brothers to find him a date for the planned homecoming celebration. Two years later, he married his date, Peggy, and they are together to this day, 65 years plus married. They were married back on September 12th of 1947. Perry was majoring in business in college, but wanted a degree in banking, which didn't exist at his school. So Perry proposed they create it. After some convincing, the University of Utah created the School of Banking. Perry's idea won him the Outstanding Finance Student Award from the Wall Street Journal. Always modest, Perry would tell you that he just came up with the idea, but the university really made it happen. When Perry graduated college, it was assumed he would go to work at his father's bank. But Perry wanted to be his own man, so instead, he chose to work for Continental Bank, which was the small bank in Salt Lake at the time. Perry believed it was a place rich with opportunity. However, after a couple of years, Perry realized he didn't have any future in Salt Lake, and by 1952, Perry and Peggy had two kids. Perry started visiting Vegas looking for some potential real estate opportunities. In the early phases of development, he saw Las Vegas as a town with tremendous potential for growth. When Perry was called upon to go to Las Vegas and determine if the company's struggling branch should be closed, he jumped at the opportunity. The idea of being able to help develop a community interested Perry very much. In 1954, Perry's opportunity to move to Vegas came when the man running the bank of Vit Las Vegas was diagnosed with cancer. At this time, the Strip was starting to boom. In 1955, the Strip had the El Rancho, Last Frontier, Thunderbird, the Desert Inn, the Sands, Flamingo, and the bingo club was just starting to convert into the Sahara. Not exactly thrilled to be moving to the desert, Perry promised his wife they would only be in Vegas for two years. Almost 60 years later, they still live there. <laughs> when Perry took over the bank of Las Vegas in 1954, banks didn't loan money to casinos. Everything a casino did was considered immoral, and banks didn't want to be seen as affiliated with them. Perry realized an opportunity to supply a need, and his bank became the first to do so. Perry felt that gambling was a legal industry in Nevada and thought any good bank should service all legal businesses. It didn't matter if gambling was illegal in other states, it was legal in Nevada and that's where they were. He also understood that the business of gambling was no different than insurance or even commercial or investment banking. Everything is based on probabilities. It's the exchange of money for a percentage of profit. 
The biggest difference between gaming and banking is that banks invest for percentage on a per annum basis. In gaming, the exchange for percentage of profit is done second by second or minute by minute. Since the Bank of Las Vegas only had a $75,000 loan limit, Perry spent most of his time finding investors, usually insurance companies, to finance these loans. Perry's thinking was so far ahead of the curb that his bank was the only one to lend casinos money until 1970. By that time, Perry pretty much controlled the market. The chairman of the Bank of Las Vegas was Nate Mack when Perry came to town. Nate Mack was a very successful businessman in Vegas, starting in junk dealing and later in real estate. He owned minority stakes in the Flamingo, the El Dorado, and the Jackpot Casinos. He admired Perry's foresight to start loaning money to casinos and approached him one day stating that he wanted Perry and his son Jerry to be partners. Perry liked the idea but knew he didn't have the money to be an equal partner. Nate told Perry these things have a way of working themselves out. Two weeks later, Nate informed Perry and Jerry that they just bought 80 acres on San Francisco Avenue, now Sahara Avenue. The rest was up to them. They developed that land into a shopping center. Three years later, they sold those shops for over a million dollars. Jerry and Perry worked well together, regardless of the fact that they were virtual opposites. Perry's a Republican, Jerry's a Democrat. Perry's a Mormon, Jerry was Jewish. Perry's very sociable and Jerry did not like crowds, but the two never questioned what the other did. They had complete confidence in what the other was doing. They were perfect 50-50 partners. Years later, Perry's children would go on to say that their father was closer to Jerry than his own brothers and sisters. Their partnership lasted the rest of their lives until Jerry died in 1998. Together, they would go on to change the city forever. Perry was very aware of the mobster past the majority of the men he was dealing with in Vegas had. But he thought what they did in the past had little to do with what they were doing in Vegas. With that being said, he and Jerry knew that to work with these men would often mean they needed to operate on the edge of the line. But they always knew exactly where the line was and never crossed it. In retrospect, Perry would say that some of the best people to loan money to were mobsters because it was a matter of pride with them to pay back their debts. He said, quote, the mob might go down the street to rob a bank to pay you, but they would pay you. Perry claims the bank never lost money on any of the gaming loans they made to them because when the mobsters came to Vegas to ply their trade legally, the thing they wanted most was respect and legitimacy, and Perry gave them both. In truth, it was relatively easy to approve loans for casinos because the majority of them were established, proven money makers. They'd already shown that they know how to run their business as well and profitably. But Perry didn't like startup businesses and never loaned money to independent bars or restaurants. He also didn't give loans to celebrities. Perry said in general, they were a credit risk. In fact, Perry only broke his rule twice for Shecky Green and Sammy Davis Jr., but only after the Sands guaranteed repayment of the loans. Shecky paid back his loans, <laughs> the Sands paid back Sammy's. <laughs> Perry's belief that confidentiality between banker and client was just as sacred as lawyer to client is one of the major reasons former gangsters were so loyal to Perry even after other banks started offering loans to casinos. Employees at the bank were told they were not to discuss business with anyone, not wives or girlfriends, no one. Perry believed in this so much that he trained himself to remember important details of a meeting so he wouldn't have to take notes. This was important because everything that was documented could be subpoenaed by a court. One of the reasons many people don't know what Perry did for Las Vegas is because he made it a point to steer clear of reporters and writers. In fact, it took a lot of convincing by his family to document his story for the book Quiet Kingmaker. Despite the idea that most of Perry's clients were already dead and therefore the confidentiality didn't apply anymore, Perry argued they still had family members that could be affected. But Perry understood the value of documenting how Las Vegas grew into the city it is today, especially after Jerry died. Eventually, it boiled down to keeping things general and the right to decline to talk about certain things. Prior to the Bank of Las Vegas, funding for casinos came from a myriad of places. El Rancho got a large amount of their funding from a government loan for housing development. The Thunderbird and Flamingo were financed by Meyer Lansky and the New York mob. Desert Inn partnered with Mo Dalitz, who had ties to Cleveland's mob, and the New York mob built the Sands. In fact, virtually every property at one time or another had mob money in it. One of the first notable marks Perry made in Las Vegas was involving a loan he made to Tony Cornero for $120,000 while he was building the Stardust in 1955. Tony was already in trouble at that time. 
to raise money so he could buy the Royal Nevada and use the land to build the Stardust, he printed up some stock and began selling it. The problem was, Tony was selling paper to people, not stock. He never filed with the SEC. The Stardust constantly went over budget during its construction, and Tony turned to gambling to shoot off some steam. It bothered a lot of people to see Tony shooting craps because it was widely speculated that he was probably playing with investors' money. One night, when playing craps at the Desert Inn, he had a heart attack and died at the table. Vegas lore speculates that Tony's drink was poisoned by the boys due to outstanding debt and frivolous spending, but since an autopsy was never done, we'll never know. This event put the bank loan in danger of going into default. At first, Perry wasn't too concerned because even though the property wasn't close to being done, they had plenty of assets they could repossess. But the loan was written by a new officer at the bank, and Perry noticed that the title to the property had no trustees or liens on it. This meant the bank was in danger of not getting anything for this loan, so Perry came up with an idea. Lou Strollo, a relative of Tony's, took over the Stardust project. He met with Lou and said the bank would agree to another $120,000 loan under the conditions that Perry be the trustee. This was important because if the company went into bankruptcy and there isn't enough assets to satisfy all debts, then secured creditors get paid first. Everyone else splits what's left. When the project eventually did fall into bankruptcy, Perry was the only secured creditor. Now that left an unfinished property on the Vegas Strip that would be auctioned off to satisfy debt obligations. Perry estimated that it would cost $6 million to complete the Stardust, and since an unfinished project on the Vegas Strip wouldn't be good for anyone, he came up with another plan. Under the Bankruptcy Act, when you submit a bid, you have to have a financial banker in place as well as ownership with a track record of success who can run it. First thing Perry did was reach out to the Sheridan. They were interested in the property but not interested in running the casino. So Perry reached out to Mo Dalis at the Desert Inn and set up a deal where Mo would run the casino and Sheridan would run the hotel. Through a friend, Perry Thomas met Jake Factor, son of Max Factor, the founder of the cosmetics firm. Jake made millions on his own in the insurance business. Perry learned that Jake would be interested in putting up the six million for the Stardust. So with the plan in place, they went up against four or five other bidders. As the proceedings continued, it became clear that Perry's group were the leaders. So the other parties got together and made a consolidated offer. To ensure that they would win, the competition informed reporters that Jake Factor spent some time in prison and was once affiliated with Al Capone. While all this was true, Jake was a guy who got himself in trouble, did his time, and been a legit man ever since. He was even given a presidential pardon by JFK. However, the papers the next day read, Jake the Barber to buy the Stardust. As a side note, Jake the Barber was a nickname given to him from mobsters when he used to work for his brother in the barber shop back in Chicago, not for any murder or crime. Perry didn't know about Jake's past. Once Sheridan heads learned about it, they went to Perry the next day and, and apologetically informed that they couldn't be seen to do business with someone with a mafia past. They knew that meant litigation for breach of contract and accepted that they would be sued for it. However, to their surprise, Perry said he understood respected the decision, and reassured them that he held the only signed lease documents and informed them that there would be no lawsuits because he intended to destroy these documents and send them copies of the shredded documents. The next morning, Perry requested an audience with the judge and explained everything. Jake's pass, the Sheridan deal, and what the other team did to sabotage Perry's team. Once the story was complete, the judge was furious. The next day in court, he pulled everybody together and told the competition that they embarrassed Nevada and that Perry would be awarded the property with one change. Mo Dalitz and the Desert Inn folks would run both the casino and the hotel since their bullshit ruined the deal with the Sheridan. That is a quote. So Jake owned the property, paid off the outstanding debt, and leased the property to Mo Dalitz and the Desert Inn folks. Once the Stardust opened, it was a huge success, the largest casino in Las Vegas. Five years into the deal, Jake died, and the Daylitz group bought the place. The Stardust would create so much more history in Vegas, but we'll save those stories for another time. History has misrepresented for years that when Cornero died, the mob sent in Mo Daylitz to take over. In truth, the entire plan was set up by Perry Thomas and the Bank of Las Vegas. A crucial loan was given to the Riviera by the Bank of Las Vegas in 1955. It prevented Riviera from having to go into bankruptcy. See. When Riviera was built, skimming began quickly and aggressively and almost bankrupt the place, leaving many outstanding debts to many companies. To help the Riviera, 
Perry had to convince the creditors to let them stay out of bankruptcy because it wouldn't just hurt the property, but all the local contractors would also go bankrupt as a result of non-payment. All the bankruptcies would directly affect Perry's bank because they all had loans out to these folks. The major creditors didn't care. They just wanted what they could get from bankruptcy. So Perry made a clever move and suggested that they take it to a vote. If 50% agreed to an extension, they would extend the loan. If less than 50% agreed, they would go into bankruptcy. Perry knew the big companies would still vote for bankruptcy, but there were more little creditors than big ones. Regardless, it was a narrow victory, but Perry personally handled the extension as well as the monthly payments of $144,444.99 for the next three years, which would be about $1.2 million today. The Riviera was run by a well-connected crew of people led by Gus Greenbaum, and they made that loan payment on time every month. However, years later, when Gus and his wife were killed in their home in Arizona, the Riviera was thrown into complete chaos. Some say that Gus was killed for stealing from the place, while others say it had more to do with his drug habit. Regardless, the details regarding Gus will be discussed in a future 360 Vintage Vegas. Things got so bad at the Riviera that the entertainment director and close friend of Gus, Harvey Silbert, approached Perry concerned that if something wasn't done, the Riviera was going to lose everything. So it was decided that Harvey, Jerry, and Perry would buy the place so that it could be sold. The reason behind this is Perry didn't believe that any corporation would buy the Riviera from its current owners. While they looked for an owner, they needed to shore up the current operations, so they brought in one of the best owners they knew, Ed Torres, who ran a tight ship at the Fremont. Always thinking a step ahead, Jerry and Perry decided not to purchase the Riviera personally. Instead, they set up a trust for their children so the profits would go to them and owning the Riviera wouldn't be in direct conflict with the bank. This was something Perry would do a lot over the years. Any sort of high-risk deal he thought he could manage would get put into their kids' trust. It turned out to be very fortuitous for the partner's children over the years. It took $800,000 to get the deal done, which included a $600,000 loan that Perry took care of getting. One final detail, Perry insisted that the current owners give them the option to buy the place for $12 million. With new management in place, they got rid of the counting room and put in procedures to prevent skimming. And within 90 days, they paid off the $600,000 loan and exercised the option to purchase the Riviera at the end of their first year running the place. Years later, they would sell the Riviera for $84 million, $21 million for each partner. Perry loaned the Sahara and her owner, Milton Prell, $600,000 in 1958. The loan was used to expand the property's casino, the Congo Room Lounge, and added 200 rooms. It would be the first of several loans he would make to Milton until he asked Perry to find him a buyer for the Sahara in 1964. Perry again reached out to the Sheridan Corporation, who was interested. Perry even found a financier, so all parties involved just needed to get together and work out the details of what would be a $17 million deal. During negotiations, the president of the web company, L.C. Jacobson, a minority owner of this area, realized that the financier was a man that had previously sued the web company. Jacobson insulted the man by calling him cheap, which caused the financier to leave the room and kill the deal. While Perry was leaving, he shared an elevator with Jacobson. On the ride down, Perry informed Jacobson that the web company just bought the Sahara because his comments just ruined the only deal they would be able to get with the Sheridan. The deal famously became known as the 17-story deal because it was basically done during the ride down before the elevator reached the lobby. Perry loaned money to just about every property and dealt with just about every person who is credited with being a part of Vegas' history. Perry's $270,000 loan to Desert Inn helped them finish construction on their golf course and clubhouse. Once the clubhouse was built, the Desert Inn was able to attract the PGA Tournament of Champions Golf event to Las Vegas. Perry also helped Bill Bennett and Bill Pennington purchase Circus Circus from Jay Sarno, who was never able to make it a successful property like his original Caesars Palace, amongst other reasons. The two ended up growing Circus Circus Enterprises into Mandalay Resort Group, one of the most profitable casino companies in Vegas history. Perry gave Del Webb the loan to purchase the Mint in 1961. But one of Perry's favorite stories is about the first time he met Benny Binion. It was just after Benny got out of prison for tax evasion in 1957. 
Benny came to Perry for a loan so he could buy back the horseshoe, which was in receivership by the wealthiest man in Vegas, Joe W. Brown, since Benny was sent off to jail. Despite never being convicted, newspapers loved to attach the alleged murders of seven men to Benny. Perry asked Benny if the rumors were true in one of his first meetings. Benny replied, quote, I never killed anybody that didn't need killing real bad. He also clarified that it was actually only five people because the other two were worthless and didn't count. In 1959, E. Perry's bank would supply the $10,000 bills used in the $1 million display at Binion's Horseshoe. In 1959, E. Perry's bank would supply the $10,000 bills used in the $1 million display at Binion's Horseshoe. Not wanting to have that much money out of circulation, Perry gave Benny a loan for a million dollars and charged him 6% interest on it. The money in the display was always considered to be cash in reserve should the bank ever actually need it, but it never did. When the Federal Reserve called in all $10,000 bills, it made the bills in the display illegal currency and valueless, but that didn't stop the horseshoe from displaying them for another 20 years. The Sands needed $800,000 to add another 200 rooms to the property in 1958 and 59. Perry approved the loan, and Sands owner Jake Friedman was so grateful that he used to invite Perry to many of his lunch or dinner meetings just so people could meet him. One of those meetings was with Howard Hughes. Howard liked Perry so much, he tried to hire him, but Perry graciously declined explaining that his goal was to own his own bank one day. Howard reluctantly accepted his decline, but would never forget Perry's quality work. In 1966, Howard Hughes moved onto the top floor of the Desert Inn. In 1967, he bought it, and so began the famous Hughes Las Vegas land grab. At the time, Howard Hughes was the richest man in the world, and in the late 60s, Vegas was in an economic slump. On top of that, the CIA was systematically investigating Vegas properties for mob connections. Once they were discovered, current owners were pressured to sell. Howard Hughes was just forced to sell his airline, TWA, and he had a lot of money he needed to reinvest to avoid paying a higher tax rate on that money. It was exactly what Las Vegas needed. Hughes' personal banker for all his Vegas purchases was E. Perry Thomas. Thomas also played broker for Howard, purchasing casinos, houses, and any available land in Clark County for him so the price wouldn't inflate when the sellers found out the richest man in the world was the buyer. In fact, at one point, Thomas moved into the Desert Inn so he could quickly take care of anything Mr. Hughes needed day or night. Hughes' right-hand man in Vegas, Bob Mayhew, said he doesn't recall any major real estate deal Hughes acquired without consulting with E. Perry. Bob also said Howard remarked that he wished Perry would have worked for him full-time just solving problems. Now, common myth says Howard Hughes got the mob out of Vegas during his land grab, but that's only part of the story. Originally, the Nevada Gaming Commission required everyone involved in gaming to be licensed separately. Perry knew this would be a problem in the evolution of Vegas and began working on a legislation in the early 60s that would allow publicly traded corporations to purchase casinos. It took three years to get done because the most respected owner in the state at the time, Bill Hara, didn't like the idea of Wall Street getting involved in gaming and potentially challenging his domination of the market. To be fair, Bill O'Hara wasn't pro-mob, far from it. In fact, he used his influence in the state to create the original Nevada Gaming Board in 1959, all with the intent of getting the mob out of town. But Perry firmly believed and guided Vegas in the three steps to operating a business. Step one, startup. Individuals building a business from the ground up usually comprised of one or a small group of individuals. Step two, expansion. Grow the company not only in size, but expand to new territories. This is where the relationship with banks was integral. Step three, corporate acquisition and merger. One of the things that attracted Perry to Vegas was that the city was clearly well into the pioneering phase and saw that he could position the bank as the cornerstone of the expansion of the city. Perry attempted to share his thoughts on why this would be good for Bill's legacy, but Bill had no interest in hearing what Perry had to say on the matter. At the time, Bill Hare was, was one of the most powerful and respected casino owners in Nevada. Luckily, Perry got through to the attorney and the executor of Hare's estate, Mead Dixon, and together they spoke to Bill about it. Perry put it simply, what are you going to do with the company when Bill dies? Who are you going to sell it to? And better yet, what do you think you'll get for it when you try to sell it? The logic made sense, and Bill Hara got on board. An interesting side note, 
Michael Milken met Perry Thomas via Bill Hera and built a relationship that would one day lead to meeting Steve Wynn, who was the first person Milken's firm would allow to raise capital via junk bonds for the building of a casino. Milken would go on to say that Perry Thomas is one of the top five most important people to Las Vegas development. The legislation listed that anyone who owned 5% or more of a corporation would have to stand for licensing as well as the board of directors. The bill became law in 1965 with some refinement in 69 that said only people with at least 10% ownership needed to be licensed by the Gaming Commission. Now that the law was in place, it was time for Las Vegas to transition from mobster owners to corporate owners. During this time, Baron Hilton approached Perry and shared his desire to buy the International Hotel. Once the legislation passed, Hilton was the first person to take advantage of it and purchased the International from Kurt Kikorian in 1970. Interestingly enough, Bill Harris' legacy benefited more from this legislation than anyone else. Years of expansions and acquisitions have made Harris' company what is now known as Caesars Entertainment, the largest gaming company in the world. However, Perry's relationship with Steve Wynn may be the most important in the development of modern day Vegas. Perry Thomas met Steve when he was 24. Even at that time, Perry could see that Steve had a lot of ambition. Perry became a father figure to Wynn, coming into his life only four years after Wynn's father died, as well as only being five years younger than Steve's dad. Steve Wynn was 25 years old when he received his first gaming license in Nevada. In 1967, Wynn moved to Las Vegas and purchased a small stake, about 5% of the new frontier. A few months later, it was purchased by Howard Hughes. The timing of these events has led to a lot of speculation over the years. One of which is Steve Wynn bought into the property that was riddled with mobsters. This led to accusations that Wynn was mobbed up, but nothing has ever been proven. The second was that once it was clear that Wynn was Perry Thomas's mentee, some found Wynn's purchasing a stake in the New Frontier shortly before Howard Hughes bought it questionable. And some have speculated that being Hughes's personal banker, Perry already knew that Hughes was going to buy it and shared this information with Wynn. When the opportunity presented itself, Hughes, Wynn, and Thomas did another deal that attracted the same kind of accusations. Hughes owned a narrow strip of land next to Caesars Palace, just off Flamingo Road. Caesars leased it from Hughes Summa Corporation, using it for parking. With Perry's help, Howard Hughes sold the only property he owned in Vegas while he was alive to Steve Wynn for $1.2 million. Wynn didn't have the money, so again, Perry found a partner and his bank covered the rest. Steve eventually sold the property to Caesars for $2.25 million. As with most Vegas history, there's a lot more to the story, but we'll save that for Wynn's vintage segment. The sale gave Wynn enough money to invest in another mentor-guided endeavor, buying up shares of Gold Nugget, which was one of the only companies in Vegas publicly traded. Perry had been interested in purchasing Gold Nugget himself. However, at that time, Thomas and Mack merged their interest in the Dunes into a publicly traded company they owned in the hopes that they could give the appearance of promising earnings while they straightened out the troubled property. About six months into the plan, the SEC said they had found that the CPAs for the Dunes performed an inaccurate audit and blocked the merger. This prevented Perry from moving forward with the purchase of the Golden Nugget. Perry told Steve the Golden Nugget has always underperformed and with the right management would be a great property. Over the next few years, Wynn purchased as many shares of Golden Nugget as he could until he became the majority owner and cleaned house. With Wynn at the helm, Golden Nugget became a juggernaut and the springboard to what would become Mirage Resorts. Years later, when Wynn asked Perry why he chose to mentor him, Perry said after the war, Walter Cosgrove fast-tracked Perry to an executive position in his bank because he believed in his potential. Wynn was his chance to do the same and pay it forward. Perry Thomas played a part in the development and expansion of virtually every property in Las Vegas before he retired. You'll find that many future Vintage Vegas segments, at one point or another, will have a story about their interactions with Perry and his involvement with their property. Perry played key roles in the lives of Steve Wynn, Howard Hughes, Bill Bennett, Jackie Gagan, Del Webb, and more, as well as various properties. More than casinos, Perry and Jerry would also be instrumental in the development of UNLV. The significance of their involvement was recognized when UNLV named the school sports arena the Thomas and Mack Center. One could even go as far as to give indirect credit to Perry for designing modern day Vegas 
His son, Roger Thomas, has been the interior designer of some of the most iconic properties in Vegas, working for Steve Wynn for the last 20 years. The Mirage and every Wynn property since can credit Roger Thomas for its interior design. Business Week once wrote that Frank Sinatra gives Las Vegas its glitter, Perry Thomas gives it its gold. In a city known for its neon lights, flamboyant owners, and epic mega resorts, the man who helped make it all happen is virtually unknown to the 39 million people that visit it annually. And that's the way Perry likes it. 